Good evening, everybody joining us from around the world and welcome to this lecture as part of the Oxford Interfaith Forum in our lecture series of Manuscripts in Interfaith Contacts this evening. And thank you very much, Thea, for organising what promises to be a wonderful evening. Um, so I would like to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, we are honoured to have here with us Professor Lawrence Schiffman, who is the Judge Abraham Lieberman Professor of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at New York University, as well as the Director of the Global Institute for Advanced Research in Jewish Studies. Professor Schiffman was formerly Professor of Judaic Studies and the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education at Yeshiva University, and he has held visiting professorships around the world in so many universities, but I cannot count them tonight. Um, he is an international specialist in the fields of Judaism in late antiquity, of the history of Jewish law, in Talmudic literature, and of course in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which will be the topic of his talk to us this evening. And uh, Professor Schiffman really is a doyen of the field of Dead Sea Scroll research, having been part of the research group on Dead Sea Scrolls at the Institute for Advanced Jewish uh, advanced studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem uh, in the early 90s and an international, a member of the international editorial team for the publication of the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, as recently as 2011 his own uh, edition of the Temple Scroll which he co-edited was published in Charles Worth's edition of the Dead Sea Scrolls Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek texts with an English translation. Um, so without further ado, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you, Professor Schiffman. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be with you and uh, thank the organizers for organizing such a wonderful program. And uh, I will be speaking to you about the interesting way in which the Dead Sea Scrolls and their study have had a positive influence on Jewish-Christian dialogue. Now, the beginning of this discussion starts with a paper by Eileen Schuler, And I actually stole my title from Professor Schuler. Professor Schuler had written what I think is the only article on this subject. And uh, I think it's a pioneering article that really opens up this very interesting question. Now, she actually talked about three themes. One was the academic study of early Judaism and early Christianity. And the second, statements from Jewish-Christian dialogue that mention the Dead Sea Scrolls. And third of all, personal relations of scholars. And in fact, my friendship with her is a perfect example of the phenomenon she was talking about. Now, I want to emphasize, emphasize right now that what we're going to see is that academic study may in fact be a form of dialogue and that the scrolls were mentioned in some of those documents which underlie improvement of relationships between Jewish and Christian groups, and finally, tremendous numbers of friendships that develop when we work together. This forum here, even though it's virtual, is a, an example of that. We're all meeting new people and getting to know new people. Now, this is very important because Professor Schuler understands Jewish-Christian dialogue, as you can see from the three main themes, as way more than encompassing formal interreligious meetings. Now, I personally go to those meetings. I am a representative of the Jewish community on a committee that meets with the Vatican, the World, World Council of Churches, etc. So I have to say that her point is very, very much uh, on, the, on the mark, because what happens at many meetings is as a formal situation, and a formal relationship is very different than the type of personal contact that happens when scholars work together. Now, we have to take a few minutes to make sure that everyone in the audience knows what the scrolls are, and in fact, what they're not. First of all, what are they? The scrolls are about 900 fragmentary Hebrew, Aramaic, and a few Greek manuscripts. Now, there are some that are, I don't want to say complete, but close to complete. Example, like the Great Isaiah Scroll, which is even complete, and the Temple Scroll that I worked on, which is pretty complete. But the reality is almost everything is the fragmentary pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. 
There are various copies of texts ranging from 225 BCE to 50 CE, as far as we can date them. They were composed before the rise of Christianity. Excuse the typo there. They were found in caves surrounding the sectarian center at Qumran. I know there were theories that claimed that there was no sectarian center, but they've been completely disproven. And apparently they were gathered by a Jewish sectarian group, the majority view being that this group is the Essenes, from which we, for which we have information from Philo, Josephus, Pliny the Elder, and some other sources. And finally, there is an agreement that's clear when one studies the Jewish law material in the scrolls that they side with the Sadducean priestly trend over against the Pharisaic rabbinic trend, which, of course, is the one that underlies the normal, normal Judaism as we know it today. Now, what they're not, they're not Christian. Jesus and John the Baptist are not mentioned. They're certainly not the third century Ebionites, as once was suggested, a group of sort of Jewish Christians. They are not the mainstream Jewish Jerusalem libraries because they are pitched toward a sectarian approach. They're not the medieval Karaite texts that were once proposed before carbon-14 dating, despite some parallels between Karaism and this type of sectarian Judaism. And they're not forged, although there are about 70 forged fragments, another lecture which is quite interesting, that have come on the market recently, and we now know are forged. Now, in order to understand the influence of the Dead Sea Scrolls on Jewish-Christian relations, one has to go back to an earlier period, when Judaism and Christianity began to discover each other in an academic sense. Now, for, for the Jews, this really begins in the Renaissance, and especially with Azaria de Rossi, whose work, The Light of the Eyes, was, uh, he lived between 1511 and 1578. And this is the first Jewish work to try to use Greek sources, Latin too, for reconstruction of Jewish history. And this is, of course, a Renaissance activity happening in Italy. And he was the first to return to the original text of Josephus, even though there was a medieval adaptation into Hebrew and translation of Josephus, but to return to the original text, to read Philo, and to read the New Testament, and to use these sources to try and reconstruct the history of Judaism. Now, while that was going on, we are getting pretty close to the time of John Lightfoot and the Reformation. The Reformation, in general, caused a whole new Christian look at Jewish sources for understanding the background of Christianity. Chief among them, was the use of rabbinic material to understand the New Testament. Now, we now know that this has to be qualified because we have a much wider view of Second Temple Judaism, but we shouldn't totally abandon those parallels that do exist, the type of stuff that is cited in Strack Billerbeck, because the claim that they are anachronistic is sometimes overstated. Let's just say that the New Testament is often the earliest evidence for certain specific Jewish practices that we would not know of otherwise, and that they allow us to date those practices back into the first century CE. The point is, however, that these both groups, Jews and Christians, as modernity started to dawn, were moving towards an understanding of each other's sources as material that would help to understand their own traditions. And of course, we all know that in the 1800s, there were enormous numbers of what we now call pseudepigraphic works brought by all types of missionaries and scholars from various Eastern churches to Europe, where they became part of the discussion. And this, in a certain sense, is what led to the amazing work of R.H. Charles, who in his Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament assembled all the books that he thought a British ministerial student would need. In doing so, he included all of what was then the known Second Temple literature, including the Apocrypha, but also the fragments of a Tzadokite work, now known as the Damascus document, that had been recently discovered in the Cairo Geniza, and to which we're going to return in a minute. He also included the tractate Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, from the Mishnah. So what you had in his work was already tremendous emphasis on the notion 
that a person seeking to understand the New Testament would need to use Jewish sources to do so. Now, the whole field was shaken completely, and perhaps it may, this may be the turning point rather than 1947 to the type of thing that we observe today, when the so-called Sadakite fragments, otherwise known as the Damascus document, were first published by Solomon Schechter from the Cairo Geniza. As I think everybody knows, manuscripts of the Geniza had begun to appear in Europe in the uh, second half, really, of the 19th century, and Schechter was able to clear out the remains of those manuscripts from the synagogue in Fustat Old Cairo, the Ben Ezra synagogue. I can tell you that uh, when I went to visit that synagogue, some guy tried to tell us that he could show us the ritual bath that Moses' his mother used. And uh, at any rate, he took us into the synagogue and I tried to bribe my way into the room in which Schechter sat with the Geniza fragments in which he discovered the Damascus document. And unfortunately, uh, when I hit $130 or something, I realized that this guy couldn't let me in and no one there could. So I have not seen the actual room. But the debate over what this text meant, the Damascus document, which describes a sectarian group of Second Temple Jews in which Schechter had proposed that it was really about a group that was sort of like Sadducean Samaritans, and Lewis Ginsburg had proposed that it was proto-Pharisaic, this debate was stopped as a result of World War II and the Holocaust. In fact, Ginsburg had some chapters that he had written in German as part of his Eine Unbekannte Jüdische Sekte that first came out in his journal articles, and he didn't continue his publication because of this fact that the Holocaust had ha taken place, and those chapters were only published in English in the 1970s, and we now have the full work available to us. But at any rate, the discussion of this matter, of the significance of the Damascus document, now called the, well, now called the Damascus document, then called the Sadakite fragments, because of his emphasis on priests, the sons of Zadok, the significance of the document was sort of held in abeyance. But I need to point out before we go on that every possible theory was put forward. Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, early Christians, medieval Karaites, Ebionite Christians from the third century or so. And I hope I didn't forget any, but if you think of another one, it was put forward by somebody. Now, of course, it was in 1947 that the famous Bedouin boy, and we're really not sure which one of the guys you're seeing is the Bedouin boy, and in fact, uh, Israeli newspapers carried stories of the death of the Bedouin boy about six times because different people claim to be the Bedouin boy. But whatever, the Bedouin boy, as everybody knows, went into cave one and there found the original scrolls that were in jars. And among them, of course, the very important rule of the community that would lead to a general understanding of the nature of the sectarian group. Now, the first seven scrolls were divided into two units. And one of them went to, the four of them actually, went to the gentleman in the middle on uh, the left, Athanasius Samuel. Athanasius Samuel was uh, trying to identify those. And you see to his left, John, uh, left from looking at from our, from his right, from my left, uh, John Trevor, who made initial photographs of the scrolls. And these four scrolls were, of course, very significant, and he tried to sell them. But before that, Professor Sukenik, on the top on the right, had acquired for Israel that had yet not become a state three of the uh, original manuscripts. And uh, then what happened is that in the 50s, Yigael Yadin, the famous archaeologist and scholar who was the son of Sukenik, was able to buy Athanasius's fragments uh, basically by sending Harry Orlinsky from Hebrew Union College to a bank vault in New York. Now, we need to note that Sukenik was the first one who tied the so-called Sadakite fragments, now called Damascus document, the first one who tied them to the, uh, to the, the, uh, to the, to the uh, Essenes and the first one who tied the new scrolls to the Essenes and the Damascus document. That is to say that he was the first one who put the package together 
which is today the usual theory. But I want you to realize that what you see here is what was in actuality a contest for ownership. The question was who would buy them first for the better one who had found them, the Jews slash Israelis or the Christians. In the end, in terms of Athanasius, he found it necessary to sell them so he could live out the rest of his life in New Jersey. And this meant that vis-a-vis -vis the first seven, the winner, so to speak, was the state of Israel that acquired them. And they are held now in the shrine of the book of the uh, Israel Museum. But this is the beginning of the contest where at the beginning, the scrolls were not a good factor for Jewish-Christian relations, but eventually they became so. Now, everything changed about the scrolls with the Israel War of Independence in 1948, because from that point on, the site of Qumran was a part of the Jordanian conquest of the West Bank, and hence it was ruled by Jordan. And it's that which set off the circumstances that the scrolls would be divided between Israel and Jordan until the 1967 war. Now, the beginnings of the tendency to use the scroll to improve, scrolls to improve Jewish-Christian relations started with a group of Christians who had been Jews and who had converted, specifically Catholics, in Europe after the Holocaust. And Gezer Bermesh, who of course went on both to contribute translations of the scrolls, but the important Jesus the Jew book, he, during his period as a Catholic, along with some other Catholics who had been Jews, advocated for the fact that the scrolls and Second Temple literature argued against anti-Semitism and for a change in the church's, Catholic church specifically, attitude to Jews. And this entire uh, notion runs through really up until today now, the notion that the scrolls in some way argue for better relations of Jews and Christians, and we'll see a little bit more about that as we go along. Now, immediately after the Israel War of Independence, the Jordanians, with British help, arranged to explore and locate the area from which the caves were, the area in which the caves were, from which the scrolls had been found. And this area that we today generally call the Qumran settlement was thoroughly excavated. And at that time, already, Scrolls materials began to be found by Bedouin who were working on weekends while the archaeologists were on vacation. And these Bedouin eventually sold their scrolls to uh, indirectly, but eventually to the Palestine Archaeological Museum, now known as the Rockefeller Museum in East Jerusalem. At the same time, actually a little later, maybe in the 60s, Israel built and opened the Shrine of the Book of the Israel Museum which is where they house those scrolls that are in their possession. Now, because of the fact that Jordan was receiving a large number of scrolls fragments being sold, as I said, by the Bedouin and brought to the Rockefeller, they appointed the so-called International Committee. The international team of scholars that was supposed to publish the scrolls was uh, included a number of Catholic and Protestant scholars, Jews at that time were basically not allowed into Jordan. Jerusalem was uh, divided by a whole series of barbed wire fences, etc. I remember uh, I went to Israel first in 1963 when I was 15, and they took us to the YMCA, to the tower, told us that you could see the Western Wall. Well, we couldn't see the Western Wall, but we could see the no man's land. And the no man's land was where the Israeli and Jordanian soldiers faced off against one another. And apparently they played games, including playing soccer in the no man's land. But at any rate, it was a no man's land and there was a division and nobody else could cross. So furthermore, the excavations were taken up by G. Lancaster Harding, the gentleman with the cigarette, Father Millick in the middle, who was one of the important scroll scholars who didn't publish his scrolls, and uh, Father DeVoe, who was the archaeologist who excavated Qumran and didn't really publish the results of the excavation. This is, of course, the team that failed to publish the scrolls. But something more important about the team is that it tended to create what I've called a Christianizing interpretation of the scrolls, which was the view that they need to be seen as highly significant 
for the pro hit proto history of Christianity, and that in a certain sense that they are a proto Christianity. You know, I can tell you a funny story about this: that when I published a book reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was a marketing director for the Jewish Publication Society who went on a tour of Masada. And on the way back from the tour of the Masada, they passed Qumran, and the guide said, here we're passing Qumran, where Christianity started. At which point, this marketing director ran up to the front of the bus and asked this Israeli guide how he could say such a crazy thing. So she answered, because there are more Christians on the bus than Jews. So we have to understand that some of these crazy ideas exaggerating the significance to Christianity that were often put forward have a market. But if we examine the situation in a fair and honest way, what we realize is that the scrolls provide us an understanding of Second Temple Judaism as a whole, much better than we had before when we take together all of our sources, the scrolls included. That enables us to much better understand the origins of Christianity. That's an important, legitimate, scholarly activity. But, you know, Jesus wasn't crucified at Quran, etc., and all the other crazy things that people might tell you. Now, this problem, however, uh, affected a lot of works. It starts because Edmund Wilson was claiming, actually, that the scrolls would completely require a new view of the history of Christianity. Now, it's not the case, for example, with a book like Ten Years of Discovery, which is a very responsible book, or Frank Cross's book, right, The Ancient Library of Quran. But the problem comes, and by the way, even Professor Flusser, an Israeli, the problem comes that large numbers of scholars believed that the scrolls had no importance for Judaism, only for Christianity. They apparently saw it as some bizarre form of Judaism that was a dead end. Instead of realizing that in the collection of the scrolls, we have all kinds of evidence for the history of Judaism, and much of what is in the scrolls, one might call regular Judaism, like Sabbath observance and stuff like that. So there was a very exaggerated picture, even among the good scholars, and that had to be redressed as we went on. Now, one of the main things that comes up to, into this question, we have to understand that when we say that the scrolls had a positive effect on Jewish-Christian relations, they're not the whole story. Sadly, the Holocaust is a big part of the story. And the, it's really, I think, the Holocaust, which leads to the eventual Second Vatican Council dealing with the question of the Jews and other religions. Now, without going into the detailed history, how they originally wanted only to speak about the Jews, but then there were those who pushed back and what emerged from it. So uh, you see here, Pope John the Twenty Third and, and, and Pope Paul the Sixth, important, those are the important popes who conducted the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and in the middle, you have uh, Professor Heschel and Cardinal Bayer. There's really a debate whether Professor Heschel was so significant in this. Jules Isaac was also involved, who was a very influential person from France in Jewish-Catholic relations. And there is a school of thought that argues that most of this was brought about by former Jews who had converted to Christianity, and that mo most of those were Americans. So there is still a conflict about what were the forces in the church that led to the fulfillment of what Vermeesh and his friends wanted right after World War II, and what the Catholic Church was not ready yet to achieve. Now, all of this has to be seen also in light of the post-Shoah trends in New Testament studies. So here, the role of the Dead Sea Scrolls in recasting the field is very significant. We don't have time to go into too many examples here, but the idea is that the scrolls were a shocker. Now, I have to point out something funny. If you trace carefully, starting where I started with you, with just some quick comments about Azaria de Rossi and John Lightfoot, if you trace the history of the study of ancient Judaism and ancient Christianity, sorry, and ancient Christianity, from that point forward until today, you would realize that way before the scrolls were discovered, that they should have realized that Christianity's Jewish roots were much richer and much more complicated than people understood. Nonetheless, it took the combination of the Holocaust and the scrolls to cause this kind of a major change. 
Now, so then hence we get the emphasis on Jewish background of the New Testament, and very important, the so-called intertestamental period, even though we don't like that term in the history of Judaism, right? That term goes away, and we now have the term Second Temple Judaism. We have all this discussion of Jesus as a Jewish teacher. How does he fit with Pharisaic teachers and other types of teachers and miracle workers and all this kind of discussion? We understand increasingly nascent Christianity as a Jewish sect, previous to certain steps, depending on what your point of view is, that separate Christianity from Judaism. There is a contextualization of anti-Judaism in the Gospels, also meant to bring about a lessening of anti-Semitism. We have to be honest that that type of scholarship goes hand in hand with tendencies to, to really uh, struggle to reduce anti-Semitism. And then, of course, there is a new perspective on Paul that places him way within Judaism, maybe even to an exaggerated extent, but nonetheless, that's what's been going on. And then also the entry of Jews into New Testament scholarship. That's actually a subject on which I owe a Hebrew paper for publication, for which I hope to get the footnotes done during our uh, spring break. At any rate, all of these tendencies are going on at the same time. So the scrolls are becoming more and more important in the understanding of the Jewish background of Christianity. Now then there comes another event in Middle Eastern history, the 1967 war, which again changed the game. Remember that throughout the 50s, scrolls fragments had been discovered in uh, what was then Jordanian controlled territory in Qumran and brought to the uh, Palestine Archaeological Museum. Most of this material had not been published. Now, the most significant thing that emerged directly from the war was the uh, Yiga El Yadin's recovery of the Temple Scroll. Now, the Temple Scroll was Jewish law from beginning to end. And I think that Yadin's presentation of this material and the beautiful edition and the discussion of it really helped to redirect the field of Dead Sea Scrolls into an understanding that it's really a bunch of Jewish texts and to forget thinking or to get away from thinking that its greatest significance was for Christianity. I can't help but advertising the new edition of the Temple Scroll that I did together with Andrew Gross, which is also on the slide. Now, another major step along the way was the rise of Vatican-Israel diplomatic relations in 1993, even though I have to point out to you that even though those diplomatic relations have been functioning since then, the agreement has still not been signed. There's all kinds of debate still going on about taxes and other things. And it seems that these Israeli lawyers and canon lawyers from the Catholic Church have these meetings in these very nice hotels every six months, and they keep claiming that they almost finished the agreement. And it looks like they enjoy the meeting so much that the agreement is never going to, to, to get finished. But nonetheless, this agreement spelled a type of cooperation regarding the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is quite significant because right after the establishment of diplomatic relations, the Vatican Museum had a sample of some of the Dead Sea Scrolls on exhibit from the Israel Antiquities Authority. And here you see an article from the Washington Post which tells about it. And they had only established diplomatic relations two weeks before. Obviously, some clever person planned to have this happen almost as a stunt. I had the experience of trying to set up another Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit with the Vatican, which in the end didn't happen for financial reasons, but would have been a wonderful exhibit. Maybe we have to hope that again, there'll be another opportunity because some new exhibits are being organized right now. Let's hope that maybe there'll be another opportunity for a Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit in the Vatican Museum because it is very symbolic. And it makes that point again, that these types of texts are at the root of the Judaism on which Christianity is based. And we need to have a total picture of Second Temple Judaism to understand why Christianity becomes what it becomes. But again, this is another evidence of the movement towards an understanding of the significance of the scrolls in, and of early Jewish texts in Christian communities. Now, when I wrote the, the book, Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, so what I aimed to do was to rebalance this question of over-Christianization. And while I didn't say this in the book, 
I did once say in a paper, and someone told me not to publish this, that it might not sound good, but I'll, I'll tell it to you with enough explanation that you won't mind, that whoever steals the scrolls from the Jews steals them from the Christians. What I meant was this. If you say that the scrolls represent really Christian texts, what you're doing is you're taking away this gigantic source for Second Temple Judaism, which when we understand it properly is of tremendous value to understanding Christianity. The minute you turn around and say it's Christianity, you lose your big source, one of your major sources for understanding Second Temple Judaism. So I think what's happened as a result, not just of this work, but as a result of the type of education of a new generation of Dead Sea Scrolls scholars, we now have a situation in which the proper balance has come back. And in that balance, scholars are working on the study of the scrolls, understanding that they tell us all this stuff about Second Temple Judaism, which helps us to understand the background of early Christianity and how it comes about, which of course is a major goal. But at the same time, they bring us to situate Christianity initially inside Judaism and to understand the close relationship of the two, which is a very big argument in modern times against anti-Semitism has been used as such an argument in many groups. Now, another step in this direction is this an, an amazing book. You'll see the Catholics really were at the lead in this, I have to say. They were, really took the lead. Other groups have followed. But the Pontifical Biblical Commission issued this work in 2001, the Jewish people and their sacred scriptures, uh, and it's just an, an absolutely amazing work. And this work provides some direct references to the Dead Sea Scrolls and basically sums up their significance for Christianity. Here you see it, the clearest expression of how Jesus' contemporaries interpret the scriptures are given to the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Although they tell you this is only one part of the Jewish tradition because they're a particular sectarian group. Then they tell you that certain biblical texts are used in the New Testament in a similar way to the way used in Qumran texts. This is the idea of Peshir, of interpretation which is non-literalist and which interprets the Bible as if the Hebrew scriptures are really happening and really describing my own time instead of their own real historical context. And this they picked up as well. This is a phenomenally interesting book for Jewish-Christian relations as well, because it establishes the significance of Jewish exegesis and Jewish scholarship for understanding the, not only the, the, the New Testament, but in a certain sense, Christianity as a whole. And it is really a very important document. Now, another point made, now, so, so, so far this is a kind of a, a history of how the scrolls run together with the post-Holocaust changes in New Testament scholarship. They stimulate it, but they're also a symptom of it. And all of this happening based on already trends that were available before 47, before the scrolls were discovered, but becoming intensified as a result in the post-Holocaust period as Jewish-Christian relations are improving and study of the scrolls and study of ancient Judaism are going hand in hand with that improvement. And very important, they're being done by Jews and Christians together. And this is the idea that scholarship is what I call disguised uh, dialogue. This is, again, one of Professor Schuler's points in her article. Now, here you've got the idea that groups of scholars come together, friendships come about with all kinds of people, whether they're having meetings, they're having dinners, they're having this, they're that. And in a certain sense, when we call it disguised dialogue, we mean that very often when we're discussing some of the questions that we discuss in an abstract, really third-person manner, we're really discussing how our beliefs relate to one another. And we are creating a situation, which is one of the ideas of dialogue, where the ability to discuss these matters opens up the type of friendship and eliminates interreligious uh, conflict. So that is, is sort of happening because then these scholars teach students. Some of these students become clergy. Some of them become faculty members. Some of them become just plain people in the pews, as they say, lay people. And all of them have been exposed to a norm in which Jews and Christians are studying together the early history of their faith. And the same is certainly the case with the Dead Sea Scrolls scholars, because when they set up the original publication team that failed, and had to be reorganized in 1991. 
That original publication uh, claimed that the team was interconfessional, but interconfessional meant they had different kind of Christians. Jews had nothing to do with it. Yes, Jews published the seven scrolls that were in the state of Israel, but the others were all being worked on by Christians and the students of Christians. And when the team was reorganized in 1991, that situation completely changed. So that the great works of scholarship in this field today are truly interconfessional. Whether it's the discoveries of the Judean desert, the green volumes, Encyclopedia Dead Sea Scrolls, the journals, Brutica Bron Dead Sea Discoveries, the Charlesworth Project in blue that was mentioned before, the Brill publications, everything is truly interreligious today and is showing an unbelievable example of interreligious cooperation and how people can work together across various boundaries. Now, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls exhibits are a fantastic example of how the scrolls have functioned in interfaith matter. Not simply because these are exhibits that go on, we'll you see a new series of exhibits starting soon, and these exhibits go on, and obviously Jews and Christians want to go to them, but there's a tremendous amount of public education around this, the exhibits, which have gotten a lot of people to understand that there are many bridges that can easily be crossed and many boundaries that we don't need. I can tell you some funny stories of my own experiences. Uh, one uh, was that I was doing uh, a tour at the exhibit that was held in Times Square some year, years ago for a group of Orthodox Jewish students. And a group came from uh, a Catholic school with the types of uniforms that they wear. Came from a Catholic school and some kid ran over to the teacher and I heard this out loud. And she, and she said, quote, he is the one and pointed at me, which of course is pretty funny if you know the New Testament. What she meant was that I am a person who was on a video they had seen to prepare for the visit to the exhibit. So the kids from the Catholic school joined the tour with the Orthodox Jewish students and listened to my tour of the scrolls exhibit. Well, you can think this is nothing, big deal, some Catholics and some Jews enjoying an exhibit together. But it's not nothing because there was a time when this type of thing would never have happened. And the scrolls are a vehicle often for this type of contact. And another funny story is that I went to uh, to give a tour in Houston. And uh, there was a wonderful Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit there. And as I was coming in, I met a pastor that apparently I had met at the Society for Biblical Literature meeting. So anyhow, after we talked a little and met some of the people from his congregants, so we went in to, to give the exhibit. And uh, his group decided, I didn't mind, of course, that they'd tag along with us. So we had the group of uh, synagogue Jews that had organized their tour and the pastor and his church group. And we start, I start giving the tour and some guy comes over, works in the museum, says, you're not allowed to do this. You can't talk out loud or whatever. So the pastor starts yelling at the guy, you know who this guy is? You're asking him to be quiet? This is a famous Dead Sea Scroll scholar. He starts saying all kinds of nice things about me, which maybe was a little embarrassing. And he shut up this employee. But the bottom line is the synagogue group, the pastor, his group, we all had a tour together and everybody had a good time and it didn't even seem unusual to anybody. Well, this is not, of course, only because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's how the Dead Sea Scrolls, just as they've brought faculty members and scholars together, have brought common people, as we'll say, I know this is a good term to use, nice, regular people who are lay people. And there have been many exhibits, and they're going to be more all over the world. And everywhere these exhibits go, they have this tremendously wonderful function of encouraging the kind of interreligious understanding and feeling that we want. And they actually function like a dialogue, even though you might not know it when you go there. Now, so we want to get close to summing up. So what are the real effects of the scrolls on dialogue? Dialogue understood now, again, the way Professor Schuler took it, as a wide phenomenon. And not just what happens when you go to some public meeting. And, you know, in some of these meetings, the Jews sit on one side of the table, the two teams, the Jews and the Christians. So there's a Jewish side of the table, a Christian side. And even if they divide you one by one by one, it's still, it's teams. And that's completely different when people are working together in scholarship. So we now have a generation of students trained to work in this field in an interreligious environment. You know, with everything they say is going on in campuses now, I have like 18 students in a class, undergraduate class on Dead Sea Scrolls, English translation, of course, 
And I told them, I said, you know, it's great just to come in here because we have people of different appearance and people of different religion and people of subgroups inside those religions. And they're all here having a wonderful time together as friends and as students together. Well, that's one of the things that the scrolls often uh, have, have been able to provide. Now, many people who've studied the scrolls are now religious leaders involved in dialogue, and they've been educated with this idea that the scrolls provide for us a kind of unification of background when we talk about early Judaism and Christianity. And the exhibits have brought Jewish and Christian public and clergy together. Cooperative research yields us really strong and real friendships. And this is an example to students and the public I can tell a funny st story. James Vanderkam and I gave a program together, a series of lectures for a group of synagogues and churches in New Jersey. At one point, somebody asked a question about if we could give an explanation about something in the New Testament and in the Talmud. So I actually whispered to him, I said, hey, how about if we switch places? I'll do the New Testament, you do the Talmud. So that's what we did. So these people were like astounded. Because what we do is we study the traditions of, so to speak, each other as part of our work, and we do it together. And this has just changed the whole knowledge base with which we operate. Then, of course, now everybody understands that Second Temple Judaism is the forerunner to the later development of Judaism through the Mishnah and Talmud and to Christianity. So the common base is understood. Also, of course, the common origins make hatred and dissension absurd. Don't worry, there's still people who are into that. But as we know, they make it absurd because it doesn't make any, any sense anymore. Therefore, it removes anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism from the agenda for those who have studied these things. And of course, it's crept into so many textbooks that people are being exposed to it all the time. And therefore, we have, because of the working together over things like the scrolls and other Second Temple documents, we have dialogue based on common elements not just differences. So I think that the scrolls have shown us a very new direction in terms of Jewish-Christian relations. They've had a very positive effect. They shouldn't be seen somehow as an independent force that have made everything happen, but they are an ongoing force and an ongoing helpful force that I think we should be very happy to see continue in this role as scholarship and study and more wide-ranging understanding of the scrolls by the general public continues to grow. Thank you very much. Um, while we uh, wait for people to uh, think of uh, questions, uh, one from me. Um, I um, I know that you, uh, Professor, are very involved in uh, dialogue, uh, Jewish-Catholic dialogue, and I wondered if uh, you have any insight into why um, why specifically Catholic uh, scholarship has been so prominent in the history of scrolls research? Okay, that's a very good question. I think there are two reasons. One is a funny one. One reason is because Catholics very quickly began to speak of the scroll sect as a proto-monastery. And this you see in the works of Millick and others. And while I have argued that if you take those terms away, and you, in a similar anachronistic manner, put on the terms of the yeshiva system of learning, you can describe it that way too, and it's all anachronistic and not really what we should be doing. So uh, that's a funny reason. And another reason has to do with the fact that the Ecole Biblique represented a very significant scholarly base in Jerusalem, very closely linked with the Antiquities uh, Department of Jordan, and that when scrolls began to come in, after 48, especially in the 50s, when K4, for example, was discovered, the Catholic scholars were very significant already in Jerusalem as very significant influences in uh, Western scholarship. So they were really there at the time and uh, they began working immediately. So I think that's one of the reasons. Uh, another point to mention is that one Protestant scholar on the original team converted to Catholicism and one Protestant scholar withdrew. So originally, it was uh, uh, there were there were eight people. There were five Catholics and three Protestants. But then the number went down, and the Protestants, as I say, two of them ended up uh, one becoming a Catholic and one leaving the group. So that's another just a practical fact about it. But I think that the scholarly interest in the idea 
of a proto monastery was tremendous. But I think it, that's really not enough for the picture because if you take someone like DeVoe, he was a leading archaeologist in, in, in the area of Palestinian archaeology at that time. And he just jumped right in and uh, wanted to excavate Qumran when they realized that that's where the scrolls came from. So I don't know if I would necessarily go so far as to impugn all kinds of reasons. But I think all of those are probably a fair answer to the question. Thank you very much for this uh, very detailed answer. It's fascinating. Um, I believe that Professor Basilius Khoen has a question. All right. Well, in that case, it is uh, seven o'clock. And so uh, I will close by saying, uh, Professor Schiffman, thank you very much for being with us tonight. It's been incredibly stimulating and a pleasure to hear your uh, your stories as well, because you've been so involved with uh, Dead Sea Scrolls research. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. Okay, thank, thank you all for uh, coming and listening. <laughs> Um, before you all go, I would just like to uh, draw your attention to our next event, which will be on Thursday this week, the 7th of March, um, when Professor Phoebe Armanius will be giving a, a lecture called The Miracle of Pilgrimage, a Coptic Journey to the Holy Land during the Ottoman period. That's part of the lecture series on Eastern Christianity in uh, Orthodoxy in interfaith contexts. Um, they hope to see you soon.